Hi guys, this is Lauren with Lauren Watkins Art and today I have a really fun beginner watercolor lesson for you. We are going to be painting cherries and this is a great lesson if you are just getting started in watercolor and you're trying to learn different techniques and skills and you're still trying to get used to drawing as well because the drawing on this is pretty simple and you can have a big impact with how you lay down your watercolors. It's also something that if you are familiar with watercolor, you can kind of take this up to the next level into a more intermediate range with how much detail you decide to add. As I'm sketching the cherries, I'm making sure that I'm not pushing very hard on my paper because I don't want to indent it. I'm making the lines a little bit darker than what I would typically draw them as just so that you guys can see them better on screen but I highly recommend keeping a really light hand because watercolors are transparent and so your lines will show through, um, especially if you're doing a light color next to where one of those lines are. Another thing I would recommend is looking at several reference photos or getting some cherries in real life and looking at those while you're drawing because it will give you a better idea of what a, an actual shape of a cherry is and some of those details within it, where the indents are, kind of how the stem comes out of them, all those little details are things you kind of miss when you're going from memory. And so if you have a reference photo or several, or even better, if you have something in real life that you can look at, it will just help you be able to look at those details and get them a little bit more accurate. So there's my basic cherry shape. I did the stems. And I kind of drew where the cast shadows will be. And I also am marking where the highlights are going to be so that I know not to put paint wherever I want those highlights. Because the thing with watercolor is that you typically aren't adding white to whatever you're painting. The white comes from the white of your paper. And so you want to make sure you're protecting any areas that you want to stay bright um, by the end of the painting. So once I got this all sketched out, I grabbed my paints and I started activating and mixing my colors. I'm using uh, quidacridone red, uh, cadmium red, gamboge, or a, like an orangey yellow color. I'm using violet, phthalo blue, and burnt sienna. Burnt sienna is the brown color. So those are the only colors I'm using in this painting, and then I'll mix them to tweak and adjust the colors however I want. For those interested, I'm using Strathmore 400 watercolor paper that I've just taped down to a board. And then most of the colors in this palette are Da Vinci watercolors, which are really great watercolors. They have really great pigmentation. I've been really impressed with using them and I'm, I'm planning on using them a lot more. You get a lot in your tube. So if you are looking to get some affordable, like professional grade paints, they're still expensive, but more of a, an affordable line that are professional quality, I would really recommend Da Vinci. So once I kind of activated my colors, then I wet the back of my paper and now I'm dripping in different colors. So this is the Quidacridone red, so it's a pink red. So a lizard and crimson would also work. You're just looking for a red that leans a little bit more pink than orange. And I'm just kind of dripping this in the background. We're going for kind of an abstract, whimsical background for this. And I'm just spreading that paint everywhere. And then I'm going to add a little bit of my kind of orangey yellow to it. And I'm again, I'm not being too fussy with this or too exact. I'm just kind of dripping it in. And then I'm going to let those paints mix on the paper so that I can get interesting textures. Now I'm taking my more orangey red, so my cadmium red, and I am adding that to the mix too. I'm not mixing the colors on the palette, I'm letting them mix on the paper. And then more quadacridone red, so more of a pinky red. And I'm just dabbing it in, not being too fussy. And then what we're gonna do in a minute is add salt to it and that will create a very interesting texture to the painting, which really creates like these like starburst effects. I don't know, it almost looks like frost on a window pane, 
with the way it looks. And once I added the salt, I added a little bit of water to where I did the piles of salt so that water could really help activate the salt and, and getting it to do its its thing. Um, the size of salt granule you use can affect the pattern it creates. So whether you're using table salt or kosher salt or whatever it is, the size of salt granule can affect it. So something to play around with in the future. I dabbed the edges of the background just to soften them up because I didn't want it to have kind of like a harsh line. And then I added a little bit of violet to the, the bottom where, the, or kind of the base or the tabletop, whatever you want to look at it, that the cherries are sitting on. And that's going to give a little bit more weight. And then I added a, a more concentrated violet to where the shadows are going to be. And then I added some salt to that as well so that we get a similar texture going throughout the, the whole background of the painting. Now I'm adding a little bit of blue and a more concentrated violet mix to the base of the cherries to kind of reinforce those shadows while the paper is still wet. And the reason why I'm doing this is when you are adding paint to wet paper, it allows the paint to kind of flow and you get softer edges. And then as the paper dries, the less moisture in the paper, the less the, the paint will spread. So if your paper is sop, sopping wet, the paint will spread a lot. And then as your paper dries, the paint you add to it will spread less and less. So if your paper is damp, you'll get a little bit of feathering on the edges. But if your paper is completely dry, you'll get nice sharp lines. So just something to keep in mind when you're adding detail. If you want really fine detail, you want your paper to be very dry before you add it. So I let the background dry completely and then I wiped off all of the salt granules that were left and you can see kind of the blooming effects that they left on that background and it's really fun. It's a really great way to add texture and interest to a painting. Then once the background was completely dry, I started coming in on the cherries. And the reason why I'm waiting until, I waited until the background was dry because I didn't want those background colors to flow into the cherries or the colors that I added in the cherries to flow in the background. So to prevent that kind of color seepage and flowing, I waited until the background was dry so that the paint would only flow where it was wet. And I wanted that to just be in the cherry. So I added the yellow and I added that to a lot of the areas where there's going to be highlights and kind of just to give a general warmth to the undertone of our cherries. And then I started coming in with our reds. So I started off with kind of the more pinky reds, um, the quadacridone red. And now I'm coming in with more of an orangey red tone. And I'm just going to work that around next to where the highlights are. So this isn't like the main highlight it's not going to be white or yellow, but since it's next to where the highlights are, I wanted to have a little bit more of a warm undertone to the reds that are next to it, like the light is shining on it. And so I made that a little bit more of an orangey red undertone. And I am building my layers up gradually. If you feel confident coming in with like your really dark darks, more power to you and go ahead and do it. I just found that if I want to get a lot of detail in or if I, when I was just starting out with watercolors, I preferred just building up my layers gradually and just keeping a light hand. That way I could control how light or dark something was without losing too much control. Now that I'm more comfortable with um, painting and watercolors, I am more comfortable going in with just the darks when I'm doing my own projects. But I feel like this allows you guys to kind of see what I'm doing when I do more of a gradual buildup or when I'm trying to get lots of detail and make it a really refined painting, going in slower is a little bit easier. But you can see we're just getting those base layers of the cherries in and now I'm taking more of that quadacridone red and I'm just starting to block in some more of the areas where the shadows are going to be hitting the cherries and starting to build up that value contrast. Now, don't be afraid if your painting starts looking bad. That is a natural step in the whole painting process where your painting will be looking pretty good and you're excited and then you do a layer of paint and you're like, what did I just do? I ruined my painting. 
don't lose hope and don't give up because there's some awkward teenage years (laughs) in our paintings and then you keep working at it and it all starts coming together again. So just keep working at it. Don't give up. Don't stop halfway through and throw it away. Just see it through to the end. And if you don't like it, at least you finished it and now you know more of what you like and what you don't like for the next time you do the painting. So I'm just going in and starting to block in some more of those colors and the shadows and the values. I'm just being really soft with how hard I push with the paintbrush so that I don't activate the paints that are already on the paper. That's one of the biggest things of advice I can give you if you're going to be doing a lot of layers with watercolor is to let the layers dry in between and then be really soft with how hard you push with your brush. You don't need to push very hard to deposit color. So just keep a very light hand. Don't scrub around a lot and don't put a lot of pressure on it. Just gently lay down your color so that you're not picking up those particles of pigment underneath it. And then I'm doing a few little wet and wet areas where I did glazes. I did a few like dabs to allow some more pigment to kind of flow in and darken areas that I wanted it to be a deeper value. One of the really nice things about this painting in general um, and why it's a really good beginner painting, even though it can be a little bit intimidating, is that the colors play really nicely together that we're using in this. So you don't have to worry about a lot of the colors interacting and like creating like muddy brown too much. And that makes it a really easy starting point when you're trying to start to paint more realistically, but you are still getting a handle on color theory and how all the pigments work. So just keep that in mind. Um, But what we did is I did a kind of a base layer of this Gordacridone pink or red, the pinky red color. And then while that was still wet, I started dripping in kind of a purple color. I took our base like violet color and I added a little bit of that Cordacridone red to it to make kind of a a pinky purple color. Um, I called it Barney purple in my watercolor class. And if you grew up in the 90s or were a parent in the 90s, you'll know what I'm referencing. But I use this as kind of that beginner shadow transition. And it really worked well with the other colors we'd laid down so it didn't get too muddy. And then I let that dry completely. And while it was drying, I started working on the stem. And the stem is just our phthalo blue and our yellow, our gamboge, and that I mixed together to create kind of a green tone. And I did a green base to the stem, and then I'm going to add our burnt sienna our browns to create the brown of the stem. And the reason why I did this is because if you are familiar with fruit, the more freshly picked fruit has green in the stem. And then as it gets older, it starts to turn brown. And so I wanted to have a little bit of brown on there because that's pretty normal, but to help it look fresh and to have, have a little bit more visual interest, adding that green to the stem is gonna create a little bit more of a visual interest and texture. So it just doesn't really read as this kind of brown line sticking out of a cherry. While that dried, I kind of cleaned up the edges around the cherry um, using our quidacridone red. It gotten some of the paint that we'd used in the background hadn't got quite to the edge of the cherry and we were getting kind of a weird halo effect. So I just kind of cleaned up the edges with some of our pinky red and then I mixed our blue, our violet, and our browns together to create kind of like an inky blue, like midnight color. And I'm using that to start reinforcing the shadows that the cherry are creating on the table. I'm just gently blocking that in. And then I'm taking a clean, damp paintbrush and I'm just touching the edges of that. And that's allowing those edges of that shadow to soften so it's not too harsh of a line. And I'm just spreading it out just a little bit Um, to just help soften the shadow and to reinforce the like weight of the table that the cherries are sitting in so they don't look like they're kind of just floating pulling out a 
paintbrush hair that's stuck in my palette. And now I'm mixing some of the blue and the violet together. And I really love mixing like thalo blue and violets together. It's like those dark midnight and like inky blue colors are like some of my favorites to, to work with. But I mix that together and now I'm adding that to the cherry to really get those really harsh shadows that show up on the cherry. And I'm making the shadow on this cherry that I'm painting right now have a reflection of this, the cherry leaning up next to it. So it kind of curves and you can kind of see the stem come up. That's because cherries are very shiny typically. And so those two cherries next to each other, you're going to see kind of a reflection of the other cherry touching it on the skin of the cherry. So I just kind of started blocking that in as well. And just again, doing another layer of color uh, to soften up those dark shadows. I did a layer of our Quidacridone red and just kind of touched the edge of where I had put those shadows in with that. And that allowed that pink and our purple shadow colors to kind of mix and create like a soft edge on it. And I'm just going in on the other cherry and starting to block in the shadows on that one as well. And I'm just taking my time. This is sped up just a little bit so that we're not here for two hours, but I'm just kind of blocking in those colors. I'm taking our quidacridone red and I'm adding that next to where we put the shadow colors. That's going to add as a transition, act as a transition color. So you can see it goes from like our orangey reds to a more concentrated pink red into those shadow areas. So now I'm just adding some more of like our dark magenta purple colors, our red violets and our violets to the cherry to really reinforce those, especially while we already have wet layers in those areas because then I can just drip in that paint and it's gonna spread on the paper for me. Now I'm gonna let the body of the cherry dry and I'm gonna start doing some details on the stem. And I'm just taking our burnt sienna, our brown color, and adding some shadows to it, um, some brown details and texture that appear on stems. And I'm just taking my time and looking at that. One thing to keep in mind with watercolors in general is that your paints will dry lighter once uh, than what they look like when you like apply it to your paper. So you always want to err just on, on the side of just being a smidge darker than what you want it to be because when it dries it will be a little bit lighter. Acrylics tend to dry a little bit darker. Gouache can dry darker or lighter. Gouache is really tricky but just something to keep in mind as you're adding your colors and color mixing that your colors will dry a little bit darker. Now I am coming in and doing some more detail shadow work on the cherries and really starting to push the darkness on them. I like building it up in layers and kind of working on like different areas of the painting and then coming back and seeing how everything looks together. And so once I added a few details, I realized that the shadows I had done weren't quite as dark as I wanted them to be. So now I'm really pushing those like dark violets in the shadows to really help give these cherries dimension. And you can see how just adding those little really dark shadows and areas on the cherry really helped it look like it had weight and that it was a round object. And that's the beauty of like making sure you have like enough darks, enough midtones, and enough highlights and having them kind of graduate into one another because then it will really create form and depth within your your image. If you are struggling to know whether something is dark enough or light enough or your midtones need to be adjusted, I recommend either setting up your your picture kind of leaning it up against something and taking a few steps back and seeing how it looks from a distance. If it looks pretty flat and non-dimensional, then you need to darken up the values. You can kind of squint at it. That can really help. Another thing you can do is just take a picture on your phone and drop the saturation on it 
so that it's black and white. And that will also help you know whether your darks are too dark or not dark enough. If your midtones need to be adjusted, because if your image looks flat, then it means you need to tweak and adjust things. So I, we are almost done with this painting and I am just adding those last few really dark highlights and I'm kind of doing kind of a little bit of a spotted texture. That's because cherries aren't always so smooth. They can kind of have like this, I don't even know how to describe it, just a little bit of like a, a texture to them, um, especially with how they shine and so I didn't keep my brush strokes perfectly smooth on it because I wanted to kind of mimic that texture on the cherries. And then I'm taking my really fine, tiny detailed brush and just adding those last few details to really help it like stand out and pop um, against the background. And if you I would recommend kind of taking a break from your picture when you're about 85, 90% of the way done with it, or whenever you're feeling really stuck, taking a break from it and then coming back with fresh eyes a little bit later. And that will really help you know what things need to be tweaked and adjusted as you go along. But I like having a small detail brush like this just to get in those fine lines and get those last few details that really help the picture kind of come together. Another tip is if you are painting something and you want to make it super realistic and have a lot of details, I would recommend drawing it quite large. So this paper I'm working on is a nine by 12, but I think the space in within the picture is closer to like a nine by nine, nine by 10. Um, I have a few inches up top to kind of let me like sample colors and kind of test them out on. But if you want to add even more detail than this and make it really refined and more realistic, I would suggest like taking up the whole sheet of paper so that you can have the space to do those details. It can get really hard to do really fine details on a painting when it's too small, but you have room to put those details in when you blow it up and make it larger in size. So I'm just adding the last few shadows, the last few details on the painting, and I'm softening up the edges of those shadows so they're not too harsh. I don't want them to stand out too much. And then I have a little paper towel that I'm kind of just blotting up anything that I feel like has gone too dark or too harsh of a line. And we are almost done with this painting. So I'm just taking my time, just doing a few dabs here and there to just tweak and adjust it to a point where I feel happy with it. Um, I felt like some of the highlights were just a little too big and a little too white, so I just softened them with a little bit of diluted yellow. And anywhere that I feel like is too dark, I'm just kind of scrubbing out and just bringing back kind of like baby highlights. They're not like full bright white, but they just kind of bring back a little bit of a highlight. So when you do that, just make sure your paper's dry Get a clean, wet brush and just kind of rub it back and forth in the area you want to bring back a little bit of a highlight in and then just dab it up with a dry, clean paper towel. And then that will bring back just that little bit of a highlight that you might have lost in the painting process. And you can see how these final tweaks are really helping the cherry kind of stand out on the paper and really look round and juicy and dimensional. And so... I, it was really fun painting these because I grew up on a fruit farm and I spent a lot of spring Saturday afternoons uh, picking cherries at my grandparents' orchard and getting a bellyache from eating too many cherries while I was supposed to be picking. That's a lesson we all have to learn, not to eat too many cherries. But I'm just getting these last few details in and now I'm taking a, a piece of paper towel and I blocked off the cherries and I'm taking some really juicy wet paint and I'm just kind of flicking it on the paper to create kind of like fun splatters and like texture, especially since we have such a fun background. This is optional. You don't have to do it if you want. I also did it with our blue col colors and I'm gonna do it 
with a little bit of our yellows and greens just to kind of pull all the colors into the background. I put the paper towel on it to kind of help protect the cherries so they didn't get too much splattering on them. You want to make sure your paper is dry if you don't want the splatters to kind of flow and merge into each other. And then just put a paper towel down or something to cover any areas you don't want splattering. And then just the final tweaks and details on this and then we are almost done. I'm added a little bit of some red to it to really bring back that vibrancy that was that quidacridone red to really make that color pop. You can see that kind of pink standing out on the picture. And then our thalo blues and our violets to really just reinforce that last bit of shadow on the cherries. And then I'm just taking my fine detailer brush and I am just signing my painting. And this is the finished piece. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and found it informative and helpful. And if you did, please hit the like button. If you have any questions about this or anything I used or anything about watercolor in general, please leave them down below and I will do my best to answer them for you. And if you want to see more of what I create, you can hit the subscribe button and notification bell so that you will know when I post the next video. I hope you have a fantastic day and I will see you next time. Bye.